how I had joined with Baptists from around the country in gathering for the annual Baptist Assembly, um, which was held this year in the seaside town of Bournemouth. Uh, and the sun did indeed shine on us. We had a glorious weekend. It was fantastic. Uh, and it was very, very enjoyable. It's been a couple of years since we have been able uh, to gather together like that in person uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and it was good to catch up uh, with uh, friends who I only usually see on occasions like that, uh, to hear news from the Baptist Union about what is going on in Baptist churches around the country uh, and Baptist life in general, to hear from the Baptist Missionary Society about what's going on in the places where BMS personnel are stationed, and then to have fellowship together with others, uh, to share uh, meals with others and to eat together, to worship together with uh, Baptist Christians from different expressions of Baptist churches around the country. Our Sunday morning service last Sunday in Bournemouth, uh, the address was given by the Reverend Alan Donaldson, who is the former director of the uh, um, Baptist Union of Scotland and is now the general secretary of the European Baptist Federation. And he took as his text John 15, and that picture that Jesus paints uh, for his followers of the vine and the branches, picking up the idea of uh, remaining in Christ, of abiding in Christ, and just what that means for us, uh, that as disciples, uh, of Jesus, that is where our identity is found, being in Christ. And he quoted from a, a New Testament scholar, Michael Gorman's book, Abide and Go, who says this, uh, Joanine spirituality fundamentally consists in the mutual indwelling of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Jesus' disciples, such that the disciples participate in the divine love and life and therefore in the life-giving mission of God. We are coming to the end of the season of Easter and the celebration of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. On Thursday, uh, we will remember Ascension Day and then the, fe the festival of Pentecost will soon be upon us. But in our gospel reading this morning, I don't know if you noticed, but we were thrown back in time to the uh, time of the Lord's Supper, uh, where Jesus gathered his disciples and had conversations about betrayal uh, and denial. And our reading comes from just before the section about the vine and the branches. And it's part of a larger uh, conversation between Jesus and his disciples as they uh, confront the reality of what is going to happen, that Jesus is going to leave them and that they are going to be uh, alone uh, as they think. Um, and that throws up for them all manner of anxieties, beginning with the Apostle Peter in chapter 13 of John, who asks, Lord, where are you going? Uh, and then uh, to Thomas, who asks, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? Uh, then we hear from Philip, Lord, show us the way, and that will be enough. And then the question that comes right before uh, our reading started this morning from Judas, who is not Judas Iscariot, who said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not the world? And they're trying to get Jesus to clarify for them what he means. They're trying to understand what is going to happen. And as you know, Jesus has tried so very hard uh, with his followers to explain to them and, and reveal to them just what is going to go on. But as it is so much with these disciples, this bunch of disciples, they are having a hard time in trying to understand all and make uh, any sense of it. All that they know and have known for the last three years or so, Jesus is telling them is going to change. And he will not be with them. And it's that that lies at the root of their anxiety and their distress. Much preferring to fall back on their assumptions of what Jesus' mission is all about. You see, at the heart of the disciples' confusion was the expectation that when the Messiah came, he was going to establish an earthly kingdom and overthrow the ruling Roman authorities. 
That had been the long expected view for so many in Israel. And even those closest to Jesus struggled to understand why he was not telling uh, the world at large that he was indeed the Messiah who was going to bring about this revolution. The issue was, though, that the revolution that Jesus was bringing was not the kind of revolution that the people uh, envisaged. Theirs was a political, even a military, uh, if necessary, campaign. But not everyone could understand Jesus' message of the kingdom of God. And we know, don't we, that ever since uh, Pentecost and the gospel uh, of the kingdom of God has been proclaimed to the whole world, not everyone responds positively to it. There are those who hear the message uh, and it just doesn't resonate with them. There are those who hear the message and forget about it. There are those who hear the message and embrace it. But Jesus here has promised that his disciples will not be left all alone, not left as orphans. And our reading forms part of that conversation that he will ask the Father to send another advocate, as our reading told us, to help them and to be with them forever. The spirit of truth and to continue the work that he has begun. It's a reminder to us all that we are never alone when we are in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, to all who call on the name of the Lord. And specifically in this section of the reading that we read, uh, this section is about the peace of God that Jesus leaves with the disciples. Now, I wonder what comes to mind when you think of peace. Uh, Maybe it is relaxing on a summer's day in your favorite place, Uh, without a care in the world, just watching the world go by. Is that what peace is for you? Or is peace just quiet and solitude, an absence of noise? Is that what defines peace for you? Maybe peace for you is simply an inner quality where we can say, I am at peace with myself. Is peace an absence of of conflict and war for you? Or is peace something that is much more fundamental and deep in your understanding? Here, Jesus promises his disciples that they will know the peace of God if they love him and follow his ways, if they obey him, in other words, if they do what he says, uh, if they follow with their whole hearts and in every part of their lives, we will know peace. And he promises them the gift of the Spirit, who is the abiding presence of God in their lives, and the assurance that we will never be left alone. And if we say that we are never alone because the Spirit dwells within all who call on the name of Jesus Christ, who love him and who obey him, then it is equally the case that the church is never alone because the spirit dwells within the body of believers that is Christ's presence on earth. And so what does a spirit-filled church look like? What does a spirit-filled church look like? A church that is filled with the spirit of God is a church that is alive uh, with energy and with passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ, living from, worshipping within, and proclaiming to all the good news that Jesus Christ brings, that simple message that Jesus died for our sins so that we might be forgiven. We could put it another way, uh, that Jesus Christ must be at the centre and the focus, the very heartbeat, we might say, of a church that is spirit-filled. In a spirit-filled church, people come to worship with the expectation of meeting God. Is that how you came to church this morning, with the expectation that you were going to meet the almighty God in song and word and prayer? Well, not just coming out of a sense of duty or a sense of ritual. 
Visitors coming to a spirit-filled church will recognize that God is at work in the people through the welcome that they receive, from the teaching that they hear, from the hospitality that is shown to them. A spirit-filled church is a church that shows the fruit of the spirit alive in its uh, congregants as those uh, um, qualities listed by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5. Qualities of love and joy, peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Indeed, an abundance of these qualities pouring forth from the members of a spirit-filled church. And a spirit-filled church knows all about forgiveness. How to show forgiveness, how to accept forgiveness. A place of reconciliation and peace. That is a spirit-filled church. A spirit-filled church will also be outward looking into the community, into the community in which she is placed, supporting local initiatives to help those who are in need and showing the love of Jesus through its activities. But also, a spirit-filled church will recognize that there is a wider world as well, not just the local community to be involved in. And so, a spirit-filled church will pray for and support the work of those working overseas, particularly with a special concern for those of our persecuted sisters and brothers in Christ around the world. Uh, just this week, I received a letter from the uh, charity Open Doors, some of which uh, uh, you will, will know of, and a copy of the, the World Watch list of uh, the top 10 countries where it is the most dangerous place to be a Christian uh, in the world. Uh, and the letter asked this question of me. Imagine if one in seven of your congregation were refused a job because of their faith or placed under surveillance, or arrested and put on trial, what would it do to your church? And the letter continues, at least 360 million Christians around the world experience systemic discrimination, unfair treatment, and persecution, which means an astonishing one in seven Christians are affected by extreme, very high, or high levels of persecution. Perhaps in your daily quiet times, you use the open doors, prayer diary. Uh, and in, in this diary, we hear stories of people like Mojan and Sadiq in Bangladesh, who were beaten up simply for telling others about Jesus Christ and handing out leaflets about him. Or an elderly couple in Sri Lanka who have been stripped of all of their local social welfare support because they have converted to Christianity. A spirit-filled church doesn't ignore such stories as these, but looks at how it can help by praying, by giving, and by becoming better informed. The best way to recognize if we are spirit-filled Christians and we are a spirit-filled church is to check our spiritual fuel gauge. Uh, now, I have never, thankfully, been in that situation where I have run out of petrol uh, on a journey. Some of you might have been in that, uh, in that situation. I do know people who have. And my question to them always is, how did you not notice your fuel gauge indicator? And usually the answer comes back something along the lines of, well, I had my mind on other things. And that's the problem, isn't it? For so many followers of Jesus, that our minds are on other things, that we forget to keep a check on our spiritual fuel gauge until it is too late, and then we are running on empty empty of the life of the Spirit, which enables us to do all of the things that we've just thought about that uh, uh, characterize a Spirit-filled church and Spirit-filled Christians. And you know, when we are running 
on empty, spiritually running on empty, then it affects every aspect of our lives, our home life, our relationships, our work life, our leisure time, the time we spend in God's presence, and so on and so forth. We so need the Holy Spirit more and more in our lives so that we can indeed fulfill our calling as disciples of Jesus Christ and be those spirit-filled Christians and be that spirit-filled church. In his book, um, Keeping in Step with the Spirit, Finding Fullness in a Walk with God, the theologian and cleric J.I. Packer says this, when floodlighting is well done, the floodlights are so placed that you do not see them. You are not in fact supposed to see where the light is coming from. What you are meant to see is just the building on which the floodlights are trained. The intended effect is to make it visible when otherwise it would not be seen for the darkness and to maximize its dignity by throwing all its details into relief so that you see it properly. This perfectly illustrates, says Packer, the Spirit's new covenant role. He is, so to speak, the hidden floodlight shining on the Saviour. And through the Holy Spirit living in our lives, he is floodlighting the presence of Jesus Christ in each one of us and in the Spirit-filled church, so that we may indeed be beacons of hope in a world that is crying out in suffering and pain and need. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that projects Jesus' deep and lasting peace in our lives. Our reading this morning contains a verse that I often use at funerals, at times when people are in need and pain and suffering because of losing someone precious to them. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Unlike peace that the world offers, which is usually defined by an absence of conflict, the peace of Jesus is confident assurance in any circumstance, that there need not be any fear of the present or the future because Jesus has promised his peace, his peace. Did you hear that? Jesus Christ himself promises you and me his peace to all who believe. I'm reminded of the words from the Apostle Paul's letter to the believers at Philippi. I think it was our church motto a couple of years back, where he encourages believers to not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's a beautiful picture in uh, those verses uh, that God's peace will guard your heart and your mind. Think about that. God's peace guarding your heart and your mind like a shield, uh, like a sentinel, protecting something that is precious and important. That is what God's peace can do for you in your life. True peace is not found, as the world may tell us, in positive thinking or in an absence of conflict or in good feelings. True peace comes from acknowledging that God is in control of all things and that God is God. This is what Jesus giving to his disciples at the time they needed most is giving his peace, his reassurance for the future. And as I say, that same peace is available to you too today by trusting in Jesus, loving him, 
and doing what he says. That is the way to true peace, lasting peace in your life. You may have noticed uh, outside on our uh, forecourt, there is a notice board uh, on the corner of Elm Road and Beckenham Road. And on there, there are various notices, uh, posters that go up, things to make you think. Uh, hopefully things that make people think when they're travelling on the bus, hopefully not on their cars, because they're then not concentrating on the roads, but on the bus. Uh, short sentences, short things, just to spark something in your heart and mind. And uh, some time back, there was one that I thought picks up what we're talking about here. And it says, uh, no peace, uh, no God, no peace, no God, no peace. And you're probably sitting there thinking to yourself, what is he on about? So, no God, no peace, N-O, no God, no peace, yeah? No God, K-N-O-W, no God, no peace. That is what we find when we know God in our lives. We know God's peace in our hearts and in our minds. That's my prayer for you today that you will indeed know God's peace in every part of your life and that you will know his leading and his directing as you seek to serve him with the gifts that God has given and bestowed upon your life so that we may bring praise and glory to him. Amen.